driving in today and I was tempted to violate the very principles that I'm going to preach on. So sometimes I, you know, sometimes I wonder if people remember my sermons and I feel bad that they don't and then I realize sometimes I don't remember my sermons <clears throat> the week that I gave them. But I was driving in today and I remembered something my dad did one time. When I was a kid, we lived on a farm up in Michigan, and someone came along and threw all their trash out in our yard in front of the farm. And my, my dad uh, was never afraid to pick a fight, so he went out and he went through the trash until he found envelopes that had an address in them. <laughs> So he picked up all the trash, and he drove it to their house, and he distributed it all across their front yard. So I was driving in today, and I came to a place in the road where someone had dumped all of their trash. And for a few moments, I enjoyed a, a you dumped the trash there? Well, why do you raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> And I had, I had a revenge fantasy. And, and I was thinking about how good it would feel to get even with that person who dumped their trash all along the road out where I live. Let me ask a couple of questions. Do you think Jesus knows what he's talking about? Do you think he meant for us to do the things that he taught? When we come to the words of Jesus, when we come to the Sermon on the Mount, we need to change questions because what he calls us to do is incredibly difficult. And instead of asking, is this practical, we need to ask ourselves, is this the way of Jesus? How is Jesus teaching us to live? What is he calling us to? I don't know of anything in the Sermon on the Mount that is more difficult than today's passage. It seems like the examples that he's giving get progressively harder, and the one today is about getting revenge, about getting even with someone when they insult us or degrade us. Big idea for today's message is this. Followers of Jesus create a better world by giving up our right to get even. Let's start by asking what they had heard. We're in a section of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is drawing a contrast between what he is calling us to be and what the Pharisees thought true righteousness was. Their understanding of righteousness was very focused on looking good on the outside, and Jesus is calling us to radically rearrange the inside. So what had they heard? What was the word on the street about revenge? Matthew 5, 38, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Word on the street was that we are entitled to get even. That was the understanding at the time of Christ. So the first point is that getting even feels good and makes sense. It feels good, and it makes sense. It made sense in light of the Jews' traditions. Jesus is quoting an Old Testament passage, actually three different Old Testament passages. He's pulling one phrase out as a summary of the passage. Let me read these. They're short passages. Exodus 21, 23 to 25. But if there is a serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, to Tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Leviticus 24, 19, and 20, anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. And then Deuteronomy 19, 21. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. 
Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is shorthand for the law of retribution. When Moses came along and wrote the law, he borrowed from a guy, a uh, king of Babylon named, uh, named King Hammurabi. And King Hammurabi had written this code of laws, and one of them was this expression, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Interesting point of trivia is up until the early 1900s, everyone thought that Moses was the original person to write that expression. But in 1901, some excavators in Iran discovered a tower, tower where King Hammurabi had engraved 282 laws. And one of them was eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Now Jesus or Moses improves the law because King Hammurabi's idea was if you weren't sure if someone was guilty, you would toss them in the Euphrates River in a place where the current was strong. And if they made it back to shore, that meant they were innocent. So Moses at least didn't pass that uh, along to us. So he humanized it a little bit. The other thing Moses did is in the original code from King Hammurabi is there was unequal uh, justice. In other words, if a poor person injured a wealthier person or a person of higher status, the poor person was injured at the same level. But if, if the tables were turned um, and a wealthy or a person with status injures a person of lower status, they just got to find. So there was not justice in that system, and Moses improves upon that. But that's what they were used to. And this form of justice, another aspect of what's going on here with the law of retribution, is the penalty was to be enforced by a family member. So if your, uh, if your spouse or child or an uncle is injured, let's say something horrible happens and their hand is chopped off, you had to go find that person and chop off their hand. And what's going on here is this is a very barbaric culture, a very barbaric society, and they come up with these horrible, horrible penalties to try to keep people from maiming and, and killing one another. And there's, there's the only, um, if you were innocent, let's say you, let's say you accidentally fracture someone's leg or, or chop off their hand or something like that. Moses created, there, there was something you, you, could, you could run to a city of refuge. They appointed certain cities that were called cities of refuge. And if you made a mistake and injured someone, you hightailed it to the city of refuge and stayed there so they wouldn't chop your hands off. So that, that's the word on the street for what's going on here. Um, and and even the people of the Old Testament quickly decided they weren't going to do this. So relatively soon after Moses wrote that law, they came up with a series of financial penalties. They, they put a value on a hand or an eye, and they replaced it with fines. So even right away, people started kind of moving away from this. So it made sense in light of their traditions. It also makes sense in light of human nature. It just feels right. It feels fair. I was thinking as I was driving in about certain movies that, that appeal to me, um, and they're based on vengeance. Like I was thinking of uh, Taken uh, with Liam Neeson, and it taps into that, you know, father's desire to protect his daughters, and you're just cheering him on as he, as he gets there. So it makes sense in light of our human, of our human nature. I can think of many times where I've heard people say, well, the Bible says eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But getting even is not the way of Jesus. It is the, not the standard for those of us who claim to be following him. Let me read Jesus' response. I'll read it all together, and then we will unpack it one expression at a time. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give him your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go with him one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow with you. That is the standard of Jesus. 
that replaces eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. What Jesus is doing here is he's giving us three examples. One of the commentaries that I read called them cartoons. He, he creates these three uh, visual images that are so easy to just keep in your mind. You I mean you can picture someone getting slapped, right? You can picture someone uh, being sued and having their, there's a person standing in court and they, they lose their shirt and their coat. Or you can picture someone walking down the road with some. These are word pictures that Jesus is using. And what he's doing is he's teaching us how to respond to insulting and demeaning behavior. The context is something happens and a desire to get even or save face is our very first reaction. It's our default reaction. So automatically, we feel entitled to get even. We want to save face. Before we talk about the application of this passage, I want to give a couple of disclaimers and qualifications for this, uh, for this text. One is context is really important, and the, and the context here are people of very little power being pushed around by people with lots of power. That's what's going on. Jesus is writing. All of these examples are typical examples of what the Romans were doing to the, the poor Jews who lived in Judea, who were powerless, who were taxed into poverty, who were subject to all kinds of abuse. But that is, that is the context. Jesus is talking to people who are very vulnerable and operating from a position of weakness. And some of his, some of his advice is just very practical survival advice. Roman soldier slaps you in the face don't slap him back. Not going to end well. A couple of other thoughts. I don't know if this passage would apply to life-threatening attacks. And as we unpack the, dra the, the grammar, I will explain why I am uncertain about that. We do know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was about to be arrested, Peter pulled out a sword, and Jesus said, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. But from this passage alone, I can't say that this would necessarily apply if your life were threatened, if you were defending your very life, if this would be a principle that you needed to apply. I also don't know if it applies to national politics or participation in the military. Uh, I think we need to respect each other's rights to make decisions about that. Um, there are some who come to the conclusion that this, this passage requires conscientious ob objection. There are others who decide that it doesn't apply, and, and the Bible I don't think is clear on that. From this passage, I can't come to a conclusion on that. And we need to respect each other's rights to think carefully and and decide how to respond to that. One other disclaimer, this is a very important one. This passage should never be used to keep someone in a situation where there's domestic violence. This passage has been, been abused. Um, I would say there, there probably is some wisdom in the idea of, of not striking back. Um, you don't want to escalate situations of violence, but you want to get out of situations of violence. And this passage should never be used in a way that condones, condones that. Um, and the church, the other thing as I was thinking about this is there are great examples of people who have been through this and repented and, and go on to build great marriages. So, so God sometimes does amazing things in people's lives, and the church is here to help anyone who's caught in a situation like that. One of the things that I love about Central is I feel like this is a place where we can just be really honest and, and practical, and we don't have to act like the situations that happen out in the world in different places don't happen among us sometimes. So if anyone is in a situation like that, come and let the church uh, help you work through that, um, but certainly we don't want this to encourage anyone to stay in a situation where they are being subject to violence. Um, here's the main point of the passage. Don't let another person's abuse push you into responding in ways that are not consistent with the kingdom of heaven or the spirit of Jesus. Don't let someone's abuse kind of goad you into responding in a way that it isn't consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
By the way, everything Jesus is telling us to do, he did in the events leading up to the crucifixion. Jesus is our example of living out this incredibly difficult principle that, that goes against the way our, our hearts are wired to, to want revenge, to want to get even. So what is the application of this passage? Here's the first application. Jesus tells us not to hold our ground. Now, hold our ground has taken on uh, a very specific meaning in our culture today. And um, it's interesting that that very phrase shows up in this passage. Jesus says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. The word resist comes from the word antihistamine, which I suppose is where we get antihistamine. I'm not sure. Um, but it's a military term, and it means to stand opposite and against an evil person. Do not stand opposite and against an evil person. Do not draw up battle lines when someone is insulting you and demeaning you. One commentary said, uh, in referring to what this word means, it's to establish one's position publicly by conspicuously holding one's ground, refusing to be moved. Another person said, it means to forcefully declare one's personal conviction, to, to keep one's possessions, to ardently withstand without giving up your ground. Now, a couple things that are interesting about this passage. Um, one is it says, do not resist an evil person. <clears throat> need to explain what an evil person is a little bit. There is a very specific word for a violent person, and that word is not used in this passage. The word that is used in this passage is an interesting one, and it refers to a person who is a pain. And Jesus does not elaborate on which part of the human anatomy that person is causing pain to, uh, but it's a person who is a pain. So don't resist a person who is a pain. So he's not, he didn't use the word for someone who is physically threatening your life with violence. He uses a different word. And the whole picture that Jesus is creating uh, is one where a person is being publicly humiliated. They're being publicly demeaned. And Jesus says, you're in a situation like that, don't hold your ground. Let me go on to the next point before I break down the implications of the statement. The next thing that Jesus says is, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. So here's the next point. Jesus tells us to accept insults and degradation. We are to accept insults. And what's going on with a slap... A slap to the right side of the face is a backhanded slap. And it's a, it's, a, it's a gesture meant to demean a person, to thoroughly insult the person. It's not a picture of someone in a, in a fist fight or something like that, um, but it's someone giving a backhanded slap to a person. It was common for the Roman soldiers to do this to the Jews who lived in Judea. It was common for masters to do this to their, their slaves. And it's a humiliating uh, thing for a person to, not only a painful thing, but it's designed to humiliate. So taken together, these first two statements seem to be about accepting insulting behavior from a person who is in absolute pain. That's what we're talking about here. I don't think that the passage teaches that there are never attacks to which we can or should resist. And I don't think that it teaches that we should accept all forms of violence directed toward us without resisting the, the violence. I think we're talking about a very specific situation of people being humiliated. And here's, here's the main point. Christians are to be peacemakers and we are to de-escalate situations where we are being insulted or attacked. When people attack us as believers, we shouldn't hold our ground and get in a fight. Our job as followers of Christ is to try to de-escalate the confrontation. And the only kind of person who can do it, remember, this, this part of the sermon follows the Beatitudes. What kind of person could do this? This is hard to do, right? A meek person could do this. A person who is known for being a peacemaker could, could do this. 
a broken person, um, a person who's poor in spirit. Those are the only kinds of people who could do this. is hard. This goes against how we want to respond, and those are the kind of people who can do that. Eye for an eye implied that the basic principle of eye for an eye was that you could strike back as long as you didn't escalate the situation. So if someone uh, steps on your foot, you can step on their foot. If someone elbows you, you can elbow them back. Um, but you can't elbow them back and then punch them in the nose. It's, it's reply on an even level. And Jesus is saying, no, in my kingdom, we're gonna, it, I'm calling you to something radically different. It's not just that we reply on an even level, we de-escalate the situation. We respond to a lesser degree because we are called to be peacemakers. Jesus is saying that in the kingdom of heaven there is a better way. It is the way of accepting insults and in some cases even accepting physical harm as a way of undermining evil. And as I was working on the, the sermon this week and thinking about this, uh, two examples come to mind and they are Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Who, re who referred to this passage and referred to the teaching of Jesus Christ as inspiring them to practice nonviolent resistance. And if, you, if we've just been through um, Black History Month and perhaps you've watched some of the footage from the Civil Rights era and you've seen people accepting insults, accepting slaps and not slapping back. But they were taking the teachings of Jesus Christ and leveraging them to make peace and, and to correct wrongs that were occurring in, in society. Next thing Jesus tells us to do is he tells us to, get, he tells us to give more than is required of us. So he tells us not to hold our ground. He tells us to accept insults and degradation. And now he says, give back more than is required of us. The next phrase in this passage says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. There is no logical reason to sue a person for their shirt. What's going on here is they are seeking to humiliate a person. You know, a, a powerful, wealthy person doesn't need a poor person's sh shirt, right? So what they would do, typically what would happen is a poor, uh, the, the taxes at this time were incredibly excessive. They kept the Jewish people in a perpetual state of poverty. And then they, when they fell behind on their debt, they would haul them into court. And they would sue them and they would take away their clothing to, to insult them to embarrass them, to demean them. Nakedness was a big deal in the, in the first, in first century Judea, and to be seen in court not having a shirt would be completely humiliating. And this goes back to a couple passages. Deuteronomy 24 says, when, when you make a loan of any kind, and this, is, this passage shows uh, God's commitment to justice, when you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go to their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Don't burst into their house and demand that they repay you. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. And if your neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Later in that passage, Moses writes, Do not deprive the foreigner or the, fa or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. So what's going on in, G in this word picture that Jesus is creating is a powerful person, probably a Roman soldier, suing a poor Jew and taking their shirt. And they, but they would not take their cloak. So they, would, they, would, they could take the shirt, but they would, they would let them keep their outer garment. Because their outer garment was to a poor person in Judea what a tarp is to a homeless person. They would sleep under it. It would provide them protection from the elements. And the, and the law back in Moses said, yeah, you, if you, you can sue a person, you can, you can take their shirt as a pledge so they'll repay you, but don't take their coat. 
Don't leave them in a position where they're that vulnerable. And if a person still has their cloak, they're not humiliated because they have their, they can keep their, their coat on and not it's not evident that they don't have a have a shirt. Um, so that that's what's happening historically here. Um, and I think this is I think what's going on here in Jesus' teaching is I think it's more than just generosity. I think Jesus is being very shrewd. And what he's showing is by, by handing over their coat as well. So this, this Roman soldier sues a poor Judean for their shirt to humiliate them because they owe them some money. And Jesus says, well, while you're in court and they take your shirt, just take your coat off and hand it to them as well. And I, I think it's a way of dramatically drawing attention to the injustice of what that person is, is doing. So it's, it's uh, you know, you are, you are drawing attention to what they're doing and turning the embarrassment around on them because it shows their selfishness and their cruelty. Same thing happens in the next uh, statement. Next statement is, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Roman soldiers at that time <clears throat> could conscript anyone they came across to carry their backpack for one mile. So a Roman soldier might have a tent and weapons and might be carrying a fairly heavy load, and what Roman law allowed them to do is to pick any poor person along the street and say, you have to carry my load for me. And the law required that they carry the load for one mile. And it was, a, again, this is a humiliating thing for a person who's being oppressed by the Romans. Too. So ma imagine you live in a place where you're being oppressed by a foreign power and that, that person representing a foreign power comes along and makes you carry their things. Uh, it's, it's a humiliating thing. They're, they're, it's deg a degrading thing. And Jesus says one way to turn the tables on them is when you get to the end of the mile, say, you know, this wasn't so bad. Let me carry this another mile for you. But that's where the phrase, going the extra mile, comes from. But we give more than is demanded of us as a way of de-escalating situations and creating peace. Radically different way to respond to people who are seeking to humiliate and degrade us. Then the last point is that Jesus tells us to accept losses for the sake of the kingdom. Verse 42 says, Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. N.T. Wright, a, a, a theologian who I like to read, said this in describing this passage. Whatever situation you are in, what would it mean to reflect God's generous love despite the pressure and provocation, despite your own anger and frustration? Jesus is opening up a radical new way of being human. When they mocked him, he didn't respond. When they challenged him, he told quizzical, sometimes humorous stories that forced them to think differently about life. When they struck him, he took the pain. When they put the worst bit of Roman equipment on his back, a heavy cross on which he would be killed, he carried it to his place of execution. And when they nailed him to the cross, he prayed for them. Paul and the early church got Jesus' message. They understood what he was demanding of them. Listen to what Paul writes to Christians who were living in the very seat of Roman power. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 21. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. 
On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals upon his head. That's an expression at the time for causing a person to become very convicted about something, ashamed of something that they have done. Do not be overcome by evil, dear ones, but overcome evil with good. Father, I pray that you would take this message and, and drive it home uh, to our hearts. Father, help us to put it into practice. Father, I pray that wherever we are, in every situation that we live, whether it's at work or at school or at home, Father, help us to be people who make peace happen. Uh, Lord, help us to humble ourselves like Jesus humbled himself. Father, Jesus accepted insults that he did not deserve. He absorbed penalties that he did not deserve. And then he calls us to follow him and to be like him. Uh, Father, I pray that you take the Sermon on the Mount and drive it home and remind us that there, there is a kind of righteousness that doesn't lead to entering the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's the way of the Pharisees and a way of cleaning up the outside. But cleaning up the inside is the way that we enter the kingdom of heaven with Christ our Savior. Father, clean us up on the inside. Make us like Jesus. And Lord, I pray that in the process you would uh, draw others into the kingdom of heaven. We ask these things in the, in the powerful and the beautiful name of our Savior. Father, we thank you for not just telling us to do these things, but thank you for also showing us, for setting an example. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.